In a trendy refurbished warehouse district, on a spring night, people gather at a creative space. But they aren't here for wine and sculpture. They're here to hear about frogs. I'm going to tell you a story tonight I call From Silent Spring to Silent Night, A Tale of Toads and Men. And Few say, biologists have a story like Tyrone Hayes. The largest chemical company in the world, Novartis, asked us to test their number one selling product, atrazine. I never heard of it. That was 1997, and Dr. Hayes quickly began learning about the world's best-selling pesticide. Using African clawed frogs in his research, he came to a controversial conclusion. We found that atrazine had demasculinizing effects on exposed males, so the voice box of the larynx didn't grow properly, testosterone levels were really low. We eventually found out that sperm production was really low. We also found out that the exposed males could be feminized. They would grow ovaries or grow eggs. It's easy to see why people come to listen to Hayes. He's engaging. Ooh, I know what I'm not drinking tonight. And funny. But he has one simple way of making the connection between his audience and his frogs. So as they tell you what atrazine does to this frog's hormones, you should be thinking about what it does to me, to humans. Atrazine is now the second most widely used pesticide in the U.S. And the EPA has recently drafted a report citing atrazine as a chronic risk, not just for frogs, but mammals, birds, and other wildlife, even when used according to labels. Chemical companies and agriculture associations refute the research, citing the chemical's role in increasing agricultural output and previous studies finding that atrazine is safe. For the University of Nebraska Omaha's Alan Koak, the issue is far larger than a single chemical. We have atrazine in the water in concert with a suite of other chemicals. Sitting just a few miles north of where the Elkhorn meets the Platte before it flows into the Missouri, Koak's research station is perfectly placed. Every time it rains, there's going to be surface runoff from both the towns and the agricultural areas, all of the water that runs off is for all practical purposes passing this point. But it's not just the water he's interested in. It's the glop, the sediment that mixes with it and always has. Many chemicals actually adhere to the sediment particles and move downstream associated with the sediment particles themselves. So it's not like we have to get rid of the nasty, ugly sediment to do our work. The sediment is our work. Because spring rains raise the Elkhorn's levels dramatically, grad student Jonathan Ali has the not-so-enviable task of hauling buckets of water back to the lab to recreate field conditions without nature's complications. What they've seen so far in minnows echoes what Tyrone Hayes was finding with frogs, though with a small twist. We see that females exposed are defeminized. So they produce less of the egg yolk protein that they need to produce healthy eggs. You may be thinking, well, who cares about the little fish? On a molecular level, it's not that different. Because the genetic structures of fish and humans are strikingly similar, and the chemical cocktail spilling into our waterways spikes during the growing season, so does Kolok's concern for expectant mothers. If I had a daughter that was pregnant and it was in the spring, I would encourage my daughter to drink filtered water. It's just the cost relative to the potential adverse impacts, the cost is minimal. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Omaha drinking water, I'm just saying why take that risk? That risk is what agencies like the EPA are studying. Meanwhile, the Elkhorn River keeps on flowing, transporting whatever glop it picks up along the way. We are all in this together. The days of thinking what happens in my backyard or what happens on my ranch is my business and it doesn't really affect anyone else, it's just not true. 